Hello, and welcome to Film Slam Streams Post Film Conversation for Voodoo Macbeth. My name is Eric Seiler, and I'm a professor of film, media arts, and communications, as well as moderator for this conversation. We are very pleased to be joined by cast and crew from Voodoo Macbeth. First, we have the producers, Jason Phillips and Miles Alva. We also have two cast members, Ingrid Tudor, who played Rose McClendon, and Jewel Wilson Bridges, who played Orson Welles. Hello to everyone and welcome. Hi. Hey, Hi. thanks for having us. <laughs> oh, th this is great to have the behind the scenes and front of the scenes people, but um, I know Inger and Jewel, you most recognizable, but folks, hold on tight. I'm gonna start behind the scenes first. Let's talk to Jason and Miles, the producers first. Jason, can you tell us who came up with this idea? How did this work? Because this is born out of the USC Film School. So just give us briefly a little bit of background on how this um, production came together. Yeah, so this is the seventh iteration of the feature film class at USC, and John Watson, who's the USC class coordinator, kind of helms the class from start to finish. And so he has a general concept of what they, the idea that he wants to run with, this year being Buda Macbeth, and then eight writers, I believe it was eight, um, come together at USC and then do like a writer's room to write the feature in about six months. And then at the end of that process, 10 directors of grad students are brought onto the project with three producers. And then we kind of work together to build the crew that's mostly USC alumni. And we shoot that following spring. Um, we shot for about 25 days. So all in all, the whole project with the school section is both uh, fall and spring semester. And then we spend the whole summer and the following fall in the post-production process. But really, it comes from those writers that come together with John and they have that writer's room and they kind of they don't really know where the product's going to go when they first sit down. And then they kind of take it and all run with different threads, see what works and piece it together. There's a great story about one of the writers that they would bring in a, a scene and then somebody would say, actually, now I want to take a pass of that scene. And so they would each be sharing different scenes and trying to see what's the best way a plot line could play out. Uh, Miles, you can totally add in here with that, but that's kind of the general scope of how this whole thing works. It's kind of an abnormal process for making a feature, but it's also something that's so special to all of us because it taught us so much about collaboration and allowed so many different walks of life to bring their perspective to the table, which I think is very representative in the film. Well, oh, great. Yes, Miles, what can you add to that? Because you were, curr you were currently at USC and Jason was an alum, so you're on the inside of it. How did it work from your perspective? Um, from my perspective, it worked very similarly. Um, the only difference is that usually the positions outside of, uh, outside of writing and directing were reserved for alumni, but I was coming close. And um, so I had talked with John Watson and I, they let me do it as a student to produce the film. Um, you know, Jason pretty much covered the beginning of how that works. But after that, when we hire the alumni, as Jewel was talking about earlier, giving us uh, the credit for keeping it cohesive, really our department heads are, is, is where we really have to give um, credit to keeping it cohesive because we hire a DP and a production designer, um, costume designer, and these people are the ones that keep it really cohesive throughout the whole project because we have 10 directors. And um, it works similar to how television works nowadays where you have the same crew coming back and the same producers coming back for every episode, but you'll have a different director for each episode, but the TV show you're watching looks the same all the time. It feels like the same movie, right? So that's kind of the model that this class is building. And it's really nice, even though when I think, like Jason was saying, there's the, it's the seventh iteration when it first was founded, I don't think that there was this huge TV model in the world um, that we were all used to. But now it's teaching us not only how to make a feature film, it's teaching us how to work in television as well. So it's a really great project. And I think it's gonna have a long life now because of the TV model that it's also replicating. Well, that that's good. That's a, a really good model to have to um, not only to train, but also to you know develop talent as well. Mm -hmm. Now, going over to you, Inger, um, how did you get involved with the project? Were you at USC or did you respond to a casting call? Well, I had actually, um, the year before I had done, actually the two years before I had done two short films. One was through another special project that USC does. And then the second was from 
a director who had seen my work in that project and asked me to do a film. And then that short film, we went to a lot of festivals, won a bunch of awards. And so when John was putting together the table read for Voodoo Macbeth, that director reminded him, he's like, hey, you should talk to Inger to read Rose McClendon. So I was able to do the initial table read. And I was just, I was thrilled and amazed because you think you know so much about history. And I lived in New York for nine years, but I never heard of Rose McClendon. I didn't know about the Negro Theater Project. Like I knew other things in the history of Black theater in New York, but to suddenly find all of this rich history, I was, I was thrilled. It was very exciting. Well, well, great. And you pulled that role off so well, especially working with multiple directors. Uh, moving on to you, Jewel, same question. How did you get involved um, with this um, film? Uh, yeah, I was fresh off the boat in L.A. I'd been a theater actor for 10 years. Um, all of my connections were out on the East Coast. So uh, I was just submitting myself like crazy to things. I remember uh, I saw the breakdown pop up on Actors Access. And I almost didn't submit for it because I was like, well, I, I don't really look like Orson Welles. Like I, I don't have, he's, he's got a little bit chubbier face, you know, he, he a little bit uh, stockier body. He's got that really deep voice. But I reminded myself that, uh, you know what? Like if I'm not right, then they won't call me in. That's fine. But I felt, <laughs> I felt like it was right energetically. I felt like it was really in the pocket when it comes to uh, what feels good, what's right for me and the kind of characters I portray. And thank God I did, because uh, then they called me back a couple times, and then um, then we were into production just like a few weeks later. Right, well, great, no pressure there. You just had to play Orson Welles. <laughs> well, well, you know, on that note, I, I remember uh, one of my first calls with Jason. He made a joke about um, me feeling free to eat as much as I like, and I was like oh, boo, you don't know my metabolism. There's no way I'm going to be able to put on that much weight in just like a few weeks. So for me as an actor, I, it, it actually freed me up because I was like, there's no way I'm going to really be able to physically look like him in time for the production and, and with the cost and everything. I also knew that my voice is naturally higher pitched than what Orson's is. Like when you actually go back and listen to him, he's got this really deep voice. So immediately I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to release the pressure of getting the physical details uh, like completely 100% correct. Instead, I'm gonna focus on his personality, on the psychology, his spirit, uh, the relationships. That is what I focused on. And so as an actor, I just did not have time. I, I really didn't have time to worry about all those things. And instead I just focused on the character and trusted that if they cast me, then I was the right person that they wanted for the, for the job. Like as actors, you, you can only do so much. And there just wasn't, it was a gift because I didn't have time to get in my head. I only had enough time to jump in and be willing to play. And thank goodness I did because I just had the best time doing it. Right. You know, to the piggy Sorry, well, to piggyback off that, you know, when Jewel auditioned, we had another actor that actually looked a little bit more yeah. like Orson, but his performance wasn't as strong and it was nowhere near as dynamic as Jewel's was. And so we had a huge talk with the directors. This was like a multi-day conversation with the directors and with the producing team and with our casting director and executive producer, Trace, um, Twinkie. Oh, sorry. Um, and it was just this conversation of like, do we go with the look or do we go with the performance? And then ultimately all of us were like performance. Like at the end of the day, the look is something you see at the very beginning and then you kind of forget about it. You need to be able to believe Orson Welles' spirit and you need to feel the actor in there. Um, and so ultimately that's kind of what we came down on. And we are so lucky to have both Inger and Jewel. Um, and so that's just kind of a bit behind the scenes of the process of that, because it was a definite consideration for us in picking Jewel for the role. Right, and I think it worked out well because um, Orson Welles is, you know, you know, this is more than a generation ago, so people don't have a fresh image of him. And like you said, the performance yeah. should outweigh the look in that sense. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the sharing that, Jason. Um, moving over to Miles, um, this was a film about a production. How challenging was that? You're creating a film about a production. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, that was probably the most challenging thing. So 
so we had to build this really elaborate set um, uh, for the stage. Um, and we had students, you know, we had a really great drawing student, uh, Ari Bach. He drew the stage for us. He worked with our production designer. Uh, and then we worked with some set construction people to like have this whole thing built in pieces at another location at on a stage at USC and then brought there in pieces uh, and assembled. And so when we first got there, our whole thing was like, okay, the production design team, the art team was like, we have to build this stage and shoot this whole movie backwards because we have to, you know, it's, it's going to be too hard to um, start to build it. You need to kind of build it and then take it down. And eventually we'll get back to where we're, we're you know, the scenes that you see where we are, um, where the stage is pretty empty or it's just starting to be, you know, they're practicing on the stage uh, or rehearsing on the stage that just has a few things. So that was the plan, but it didn't work out. We got there and <laughs> there was just no way in the world that time-wise and with the manpower that we had, uh, that we were we gonna We had also to... a lot of other logistics. That yeah, there was tons. Of place, like with yeah. the finale, we weren't ready for it. Like there was a lot. It was just too much, you know, and that finale is, is a big, undertaking you know obviously this is a, a you know we had a collaboration with warner brothers on this they helped us with a lot of things but it's still to some degree a student film um and uh, everyone knew that everyone was involved so it's a very much like um ev all hands on deck type of film so we scrapped that idea entirely because we would have we would have wasted so much time so we just started shooting immediately with the blank stage um so we could get stuff in the can um, and then over time, we slowly had to build this stage. But with that, we had to stay long nights, come early mornings to build this stage. Everyone was there helping out, you know, drilling, and hammering. We had but, to yeah. basically like deconstruct the stage every time we left the location for the weekend because this theater right. was a working theater. So other people had to come in and use it on the weekends. And so we would have to de deconstruct everything, push it all the way back. And then at the, at the start of every week, bring it forward. And then we ended up having to do this like crazy jigsaw of a schedule to do some of the finale in the second week because we still had to take apart the stage to work backwards again a little bit. Yeah. Um, because you can't really do like when you're creating a show coming to life, you need the different stages of the set build and you can't just build <laughs> every single one. You have to like take down because it's just, you know, more cost effective. Um, and so it was a crazy challenge to kind of bring that to life in a lot of different ways there's a lot of like thinking on our feet changing different things telling our actors we're actually going to shoot this scene today are you ready <laughs> and then being like i guess like if that's what you're going to tell me no, uh, any but you but, but, but you but you pulled it off that's the great thing about it and i guess that's the liberty about making a film about a production because in production lots of moving parts so you had that to um to help you out i just want to let everyone know we are talking to cast and crew from voodoo macbeth if you have questions please put them in the q a portal and we'll get to them as time allows um inger over to you um your role your role as on rose mcclendon rose had this you know kind of like a smart aleck kind of personality with these you know one-liners and so forth what did you do to prepare for that role and did you um improvise at all or did the, were the directors really strict that you had to really stick to your script um well to be honest the i thought the script was so well written i didn't really need to improvise i mean and i was thrilled because i had the best snarky one-liners ever mm -hmm. <laughs> so it made her a lot of fun to play um i think a lot of the preparation i would say kind of like jules a lot of my preparation was because there is like there's a certain amount that's known about Rose McClendon and some of that material was in New York and with like Jewel said the short amount of time between you know finding out we're doing it and then starting to shoot I wasn't able to do the kind of research I might have done otherwise so I really think it was more important to focus on the relationship to focus on how she was interacting with um, Orson Welles what she wanted overall for this group of people and the production and her own dreams because her dream was to play Lady Macbeth. So, you know, just trying to figure out what her, what was driving her through the whole thing was what I tried to focus on. 
Oh, well, good. Well, good. And you, you pulled it off. Um, I'm going to uh, ask you a little later to give us one of those one liners, if you can remember. If, not, <laughs> if I can remember one. one. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you one at a little later. But over to you, Jewel. Your role was obviously very um, um, challenging because your character um, went through transformations, you know, with your wife battling, you know, alcohol and trying to direct this play and so forth. So tell us a little bit about your preparation and also shooting out of order too. What was the experience like working on the film? Oh yeah, so I mean, that's, I think that's kind of a reality I think for most uh, film sets and, and TV is that you, you don't shoot it in order. So uh, it, with a situation like that, um, there, there are certain, you develop a rapport with your, with your cast, like the further, the further, the deeper in you get. So even looking back, um, I'm very, very proud of my work and I'm really, really proud of our film, but there are a couple of times I'm like, oh, like that film, that scene happened in the very beginning. And I might've done that a little, I might approach it a little bit differently if we had approached it on down the line. But I mean, you don't get that, you don't get that luxury as an actor. Instead, you have to do your best. And you, you know, I, I knew the script, I, I, I knew the arc, I, I knew where we were no matter, and I, I did extensive work with coordinating with our costume department and our makeup department when it came to continuity, because there were different points where his hair was like this and he had gotten, he had gotten punched in the eye and it's like, oh, is the, is the black eye at, at day four here or is it at day two? And, and I, I was very concerned about that kind of stuff because I, I, while, I knew that those departments, it was their responsibility. It's also mine. And the more eyes you have on something, the better. And it was very important for me to have that very clear because I've been in a situation where I've been on set where we if we forgot to put on like a stage makeup or an injury and we had to go back and reshoot. And I lost a take that I knew was great because and I learned my lesson and that was a short that I did. And I learned my lesson on that. And I've always kept my eye on those kinds of things. Um, but you asked, uh, forgive me, you asked another question beyond uh, shooting in order. How oh, about you just um, experience overall, which you gave us a good sense of. Oh yeah, my my experience shooting it was was really incredible. I, I was so grateful and so excited to do, to do this project. Um, you know, there were, there were a lot of conversations like from, from the get go, from from the read through, and I, especially with the subject matter and with with Orson being this white leader, and especially with everything going on in our world, um, before I read the script, I was it was very important for me to see, okay, how are we setting up Orson? Is he coming in thinking he's going to be like the savior of this community, or is he going to end up giving it back? And inevitably, he does there was concern for me with how his own mistakes and how his own sins are kind of, are they absolved? Uh, does he, cause he loses his cast because he does some really uh, racially insensitive, insensitive puts it in a, in a very like subdued way, but he does some things that are completely unacceptable and not okay. Uh, how do you come back from that? Do I was, there was concern for me of um, with Orson, there was always like a fine line because yes, there was the abuse. Yes, there was like the drug abuse, but is he, if you go too far with it, you can potentially not only lose his cast in the show, but also lose the audience. And it was important for me to navigate that. And from the way I was coming at it was that Orson never was doing things to intentionally hurt anybody. He was just so caught up in his narcissism and his journey and his brilliance that he completely walks over people and inevitably he learns the importance of collaboration and by the end he does give it back to the community who it should serve and it should be their vessel and it shouldn't be about him. Um, but those kinds of questions also considering our current political climate were really important. And I'm so grateful for, for all of our cast, for our writers, for our directors, because everybody handled that with sensitivity and everybody's voices were included. And uh, I, I was really proud with how it, how it was really shaped in the story that we told as a result. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I agree. And especially just living up to knowing 
what Austin Wells will become after that. So mm -hmm. he had to be careful on how his character was shaped. Um, he also was 20 years old. I, yeah. I, it still blows my mind. He did this production at 20. What, I mean, all, all of you, all of you kids looking at this, that's for a lot of you, that's only a few years away from where you're at. It's so bizarre to me. Sometimes I think, hey, oh, I guess it was just like a different time. But that that really, it, it really speaks to the cojones that he has, like the confidence that he had. Like he was the kind of kid that at 16 walked into a professional Shakespeare thing and pretended to have all this experience. And they knew he was BSing them, but they gave him an audition anyway. And he blew them out of the water. Like, so there the whole myth of Orson Welles is based on real truth and substance. Uh, so, uh, but it still amazes me. I, I always have to remind myself, he was 20 when he did this. And this was arguably one of his greatest hits commercially uh, of, of his entire uh, career. And, and the, I mean, you're meaning um, for his resume and including Citizen Kane too. Yes, well, I mean, the, he, Citizen Kane is is one of his greatest hits. But when you looked at like the box office and how much like he he reaped, uh, at least in the short term, one of the things he often said was that Voodoo Macbeth was one of his greatest successes. It ran for a long time. It had an successful tour. Yeah. There wasn't any kind of, even though there was controversy leading up to its opening, once it opened and toured, it, it, there was so much praise, but this came from his mouth that he really believed that Fumit Beth was one of his greatest successes in his career. Right, great. Uh, we do have one question that has come and I'll ask that in a moment. Before I ask that question, I just want to know, maybe Jason or Miles, you can answer this. Um, how tr how tr truthful was the script? Did, um, did the writers put anything in there just to make it a little more um, dramatically appealing or did you really stick to the facts um, that you found out through your research? Um, I'll, I'll go first, Jason, then you can follow up. Um, so it's, you know, with every, I think with every story that you're telling from the past, you want to sort of pull it forward to the current day to kind of examine the world that we're living in now. So I think that that was the writer's um, objective in this. Um, so yes, there's definitely some fabrications. There's definitely some storylines that are dramatized and stuff like that but it's more to reflect the current day that we're living in. Um, it kind of goes back to what Jewel's saying is like, how are we shaping Orson Welles to reflect like today? You know, we don't want to, you know, we want to be careful of how we do things. So yes, there's some fabrications in this story um, to kind of reflect on those times. You know, there's an immigration uh, subplot that was had, had some truth to it, had some facts that helped us get to that point. Um, but I'm not sure if it's exactly true that the original Wano was, you know, taken for immigration and stuff like that. But we wanted to kind of pull forward, like when you have a character like Martin Dyes, who is like a politician with an agenda. Um, and we still, at this time, we have politicians with agendas that might use their power to do certain things and derail certain things in order for, you know, um, <clears throat> for their personal gain or for their political agendas to, you know, um, go in the direction that they wish. Um, so yeah, so, but for the most part, we stayed as true as we could to um, the facts and, and to the history. Um, and yeah, Jason. Yeah, I mean, um, a big conversation for us was making a 1936 story told through a 2020 lens. Mm -hmm. And that was a big choice for all of us going into it. And it was extremely important for us. Um, I think like, you know, like Miles said, there's always some dramatization that happens when retelling true stories. Um, life as interesting as it is sometimes <laughs> needs a little bit of a kick to make it a narrative feature um, and to condense things like there's a lot of condensing of timelines here um, that kind of change things around or pulling from Orson's different parts of his life and kind of things like that so yeah there's some definite changes around there but I think we tried to stay true to the heart and the truth of this, that story um, and that was kind of our guiding force with that throughout the whole thing. Um, but that's, we did a ton of research, like the production design team, like the books that you would see from our production designer, Maureen Jensen, when she was preparing for this was insane. John Watson and the writers had like a stack of research 
um, before we even started shooting, I actually went to New York and Harlem and walked around where the Lafayette Theater used to be, went, walked blocks all around just to kind of see where would Rose walk, where would Housewoman walk, where would Orson walk, and just like feel the environment. So there was a lot of research involved in how we were telling the story, and it was very conscious in what we were doing, and everything was very specific in uh, the retelling. Great. Well, I'm just going to throw this question out to anyone that's come in and just bear with me as I read through it. Now, this person was wondering, how do you feel about the new, in quotes, New Deal kind of funding during this tough time here in America? Do you have hope that rich artistic work will come from relief funding we are seeing that has come out of the COVID devastation and that we will see a new gilded age of the arts? So. Oh. <laughs> Great question. Uh, anyone want to try to tackle that question? You know, that there used to be in a, a real endowment of the arts here in the country. And over the years that got slashed. Uh, you, you've seen, not to get into politics, and, and I, I won't, but there's a lot of people uh, in this country that I think that look at the arts as very frivolous. Like in comparison to where we could put our dollars, there are things that are better put. And quite frankly, when you look at other countries, other countries value art based upon the kind of government funds that they put towards it. Um, I, I think a lot of that also speaks to the history of our own country, how we were founded and the, the kind of value system there is and other countries that have been around for a lot longer and that have birthed a lot of uh, classic antiquity art. They value it so much because it's just been in their bones and their life up for thousands for so long. I think that there absolutely is a possibility for those things to develop. And I, I am like you guys, I am very hopeful that as a result of the climate that um, other government agencies and other interests will funnel money into um, arts funding, not just, um, not just for education purposes, but also professionally. I think because all of those things feed into itself. If nothing else, when you look at the, the budget of, when you look at New York and how much money uh, an entity like Broadway actually brings in and how it fuels the economy of a city of New York when it comes to other businesses. There's a really, you can make a lot of really great uh, warrant that uh, arts is not just, uh, is not just for entertainment, that it does fuel economies and it develops um, that stuff. So I'm very hopeful with all of you guys. I think it's a I think it's a matter of wait and see. And I will say that if you really feel that that is important, um, it really, in my opinion, those kinds of changes don't really start in Congress. Those kinds of changes starts at the local level. You know, it, it comes about how do we pass down to our local communities the importance of arts? So if you feel that way, really incur, get involved in the arts communities in your local sphere. As you get older, uh, really pass down those, the importance of art to, to your kids and the people around you. Because as those grassroots things change, uh, the legislation will change and follow it. So um, that's kind of how I feel. Well, great. For me, well said. Well said. Um, for me, art is born from like a deep like self introspection and reflection and who you are. And like I feel like this last year has given a lot of us time to understand in a deeper way who we are because we've been by ourselves for so long. And I think we're actually going to be experiencing a whole different wave of art because a lot of people are coming out of this with a whole new mindset of the way they want to live their life. Also, people are craving art right now. That's one of the things we're really deprived of. Like, I have museum tickets for this Van Gogh Museum in LA for December, because I'm just so excited to be able to go to this. And I'm hoping that December will be like, everything's great, you know? So I, I think there is a huge wave coming of just artistry and individualism that's going to be shown through artistry in a very cool way that I'm personally very excited for. And I'm excited to see the stories that come out of what people have been thinking about for this past year, because um, we've all had some deep revelations, whether we like to admit it or not. Right. It's been a challenging year. So I think that's, you know, different. It's not necessarily have to do anything with the government, but with your own self, I think we're going to be experiencing a lot of um, cool art coming. I, 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 go ahead, Andrew. No, I was just going to say, I will say one thing that I think has happened during the pandemic, which um, I think is wonderful. And as much as I prefer doing things live, suddenly 
we all have more access to more things that we would not normally be able to see, whether it's theater, whether it's exhibits, because they found a way to put them online, to stream them. So I think in some way, the pandemic has been, I don't want to say like the great equalizer, but it's given more people access to things that don't require getting on a plane, flying to New York and seeing this Broadway show or seeing a show at the National or seeing a special exhibit. You can actually see it online. Now, is it as good as seeing it in person? You know, I don't know that I would say that, but suddenly more people have access to it. And I think that's the most important thing about art, because like they were saying, it is the lifeblood. I mean, so many, so many things that are important to our well-being as humanity. I think that art encapsulates and inspires. So the more you can bring art to the masses, for lack of a better way to put it, I think the more important that is. And as Jewel was also saying, I think as you all are students and as you grow up, you have to insist on things, but even where you are now, make sure your parents know, make sure your administrations know, you need art in the schools, you need art in all these spaces, and they're trying to take it away. And in some places, it's not even trying to take it away, it's gone. So you have to let people know the importance of what it's done to you, how it's affected you, the ways it's helped you to grow so that we can continue to have it for everyone. Uh, students, real quick, when you're when you're watching art as a result of all of you guys being in pandemic, not connecting with one another, and I know we're all grown up in a digital digital world with social media, but when you are back in a group, when you're watching a performance, when you're engaging with an art, take a moment, take a moment and step back and just clock how your experience of that art or that moment or that performance has changed because of the people that you're with, because of the, because one of the unsaid things, you experience it far more with like theater, but you also experience it with film, that the audience changes oftentimes the experience of that art. When you go to see a play, like different audiences will laugh harder and more uproariously. And the show itself doesn't change that much, but the audience does. If nothing else, I think this time really encapsulates how being with one another, experiencing things with each other, uh, absolutely changes the way we remember it and the way we receive it. So I really encourage each of you, when you're back in that position, take a moment and really just register how magical it is and how looking at that painting or listening to that song or seeing that movie changed based upon the people that you were, you were around and let that empower you to seek out and experience more things like that. Some very, very good information, good um, advice too. Um, we need to wrap up here now. As we wrap up, I'm just gonna go around and find out what's next for all of you. Let me start with you, Inger. Well, what can we expect to see from you in the future? Um, well, I actually, I just um, finished directing a play at USC. I can't, somehow USC has seemed to grab hold of me. Um, but I just directed a play by a young um, black female playwright um, who's from the British Virgin Islands and it's called The Blood of a Hibiscus. Um, so that's uh, showing tonight and tomorrow afternoon through the New Works Festival at USC. And uh, we'll see what else is coming. I've got some other stuff up my sleeve that I'm not ready to talk about yet. <laughs> okay, but if, um, if we see you in front of the camera and you have to audition and um, you had to give a line from Voodoo Macbeth, what line would you say? <laughs> oh, I think one of my favorite lines is Orson is talking about Cuba and he says, oh, he has stage presence. And Rose says, he is presently on stage. That's the extent of his stage presence. Okay. <laughs> exactly. That's that's one of the um, key lines that was there. And thank you for delivering that. <laughs> Over you, Will. Well, what's next for you? What can we expect to see from you? Uh, you know, there were a couple of things that I was supposed to start shooting uh, and then the pandemic hit that have been delayed. I can't speak to th about them presently, but uh, I'm excited to be able to shoot those pretty soon. Um, and in the meantime, I'm just so thrilled that our little engine that could is making its uh, circuit on the film circle, uh, on all the film festivals. And I'm so excited that you guys are experiencing it. It's, it's such a pleasure. Okay, great. Okay, and Miles, what about you? 
Um, same with Jewel. I have a few films in development that I can't talk about yet, but I hope to let the world know soon. Um, but I also am um, very happy that this film is making on the film circuit. I made another film uh, with uh, one of the directors who was supposed to be with us today, but he had something come up. His name is Agazi. Uh, and it just got into Tribeca. Um, and so we're excited about that. And um, that'll be this, this uh, coming up this summer in New York. Um, and it also got into the HBO festival in Martha's Vineyard. Um, so we're very excited about that as well. And um, yeah. Okay, great, great, good luck. And um, Jason. Yeah, so um, I have a few projects as well. Jewel and I are working on a musical together, which has been really fun. Um, and I'm just currently writing a lot of projects. I have a short that's going in the festival circuit as well. Um, and just trying to see what happens. I'm really passionate about making stories for the LGBTQIA plus community and empowering the LGBT youth as well. So that's kind of a big focus of a lot of the work that I've been doing right now. And to all the students, like if you guys do have any other specific questions, feel free to reach out. I don't know how you can <laughs> contact us, but if there's a way you can get to us, please, like I'm always here for you guys. Um, and if you want to be a filmmaker and actor, like just go for it and do it. That's my best piece of advice is you just got to make the leap and the jump because there's nothing, yeah, there's nothing holding you back. You just got to trust yourself and know that it will be okay. Um, Based on that, you can find Jason on Instagram. Uh, Jason, what's your <laughs> what's your handle on Instagram? Oh my gosh, Jason Lee Phillips underscore film. <laughs> very, that, very. That was my next question. Yeah, so all of you on social media. If so, can you tell us how we can find? Because someone wants to know how they can access your work and so forth. Um, Jewel, are you on social media? I am. Uh, you can uh, you can message me uh, my and find me at my Instagram handle uh, uh, at uh, Jewel Wilson Bridges the most uninteresting handle, but it's my name. <laughs> what about you, Miles? Are you? Yeah, you can find me. It's at Miles underscore Alva. Okay. And what, Inger? And uh, yeah, Instagram and Twitter, I'm at Inger Tudor. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So, hey, you might get a lot more followers after this. So um... <laughs> You can also contact us at the Voodoo Macbeth film website um, and yeah. there's an email on that website and if you email that it will come directly to us and we can connect you with anyone that you're interested in talking with. I think you can also pretty much google any of us and I think you'll find other ways to contact us as well so yeah there's yeah. lots of ways. <laughs> right and has USC announced their uh, next film that they're doing yeah? Yes I think so so they so COVID pushed the last film but they think they're ready to do it this fall and it's gonna be Phantom of the Opera um, or a take on Phantom of the Opera at least. I think Jewel, are you involved in that one? I, I Yeah, I am. So and unless I book something else, I was gonna do the Phantom. I, I even got like the, the casting for the mask and then a uh, pandemic hit. So I'm still waiting, we're still waiting to, for like final confirmation, but right now it's the Morpheus. Yes, it's happening. So Jewel, you're, you're being cast as the Phantom? Yes. So oh, it's, wow. it's going back to kind up. of the source. It's going back to the source material. It's not, uh, it's not like a musical telling, like, like right. the Phantom of the Opera musical. Mm -hmm. It is a film, um, but it should be really cool. I mean, the script was really cool. I, I bet. Time. I, I bet. Wow. <laughs> Can't <laughs> wait to see that. Well, this has been such a pleasure, all of you. I thank you all for taking time out and joining us today. We had the producers, Jason Phillips and Miles Alva, and two cast members, um, Inga Tudor, who was most, Rose McClendon, and Jewel Wilson Bridges, who was Orson Welles. Thank you all very much for your time thank today. You. Thank, thank you so much for having us. And thank you to our audience for joining us for this important and invigorating conversation. For more information about the current 45th Pleva International Film Festival or any of our upcoming film festivals, please continue to follow us on social media or visit clevelandfilms.org. I'm Eric Seiler. Thank you. <laughs>